Hello and welcome to today's video. So today's video is going to be about religious organisations and sects. And really this is just an introductory lesson, so getting those definitions in place. So the objectives for today's video is to discuss and define churches, sects and denominations and just to identify some of the key features between the three of them. So typologies of religious organisations, this is something which we're really going to have to get used to. And this is a fundamental part of sociology of religion because we need to understand what are the different organisations that are used and operated within religious institutions. Now, although individuals can have their own religious beliefs without belonging to an organisation, most believers are members of religious organisations, which tend to shape their practices and beliefs. So it gives them a guideline in which they have to follow. Now, Trotsky in 1931 provided us for a definition of church and a sect. Now, prior to this, in 1929, Nabia has argued that we need to take into account of the situation in that in the United States of an intermediate type of religious organisation. The denomination has started to occur. Now, this is where we've got our three main typologies, the church, the sect and the denomination. Now, these are the three that will be the main focus of today's videos. And each one of these will be given the definition by Trotsky or Nabia. And then we're going to look at some of the key features of each one of them. Now, the definition of a church. So according to Trotsky, the church is a large religious organisation where members do not usually have to demonstrate their faith. It's that they are born into it and recruited based on family ties before they can understand its teachings. So in theory here, churches are not voluntary to an extent. They are things which are dictated and controlling society. So we are automatically a member of, for example, the Church of England because we are born in the United Kingdom. So therefore, we are recruited based on our family ties to the country rather than us voluntarily opting to be a member of this church. Now, membership for the churches, they try to be universal. So they try to include every member of society. So draw them in and get them involved in terms of the processes. Because of their size, members are drawn from all classes. But since the church is part of the establishment, higher classes are particularly well represented because it has got better ideology and understanding of those classes in a sense here because they are the foundational people that have built and created the institution itself. Now for this reason churches tend to be ideological conservative supporting the values and beliefs of those in a position of power so they will only support those who are then going to create and manipulate the ideology of the country they will never go against. Now, this is usually because the churches are usually tied to the state. So, for example, the Roman Catholic Church throughout the Middle Ages in most of England and um, in Europe really had a good relationship with the state and helped control policy and dictate laws that may have to go into power to ensure that those beliefs and the country maintained a good traditional stance. Whilst in Britain today, the Church of England is still connected to the state since the Queen is head of both the Church of England and the state. So therefore, um, it can still draw in some influence in our society. So it's not wholly secularised at the minute. Now, is the church tied closely to the state in the US? Now, in the USA, obviously, they've got various types of um, denominations which are present within society and there isn't one single church that is connected to the state. However, obviously Christianity has provided some of the foundations of US law. So there is a bit of a paradox in terms of the US. Now, churches often carry out social functions such as being involved in politics and running in the schools. So they will help and maintain and create um, the policy that is needed to ensure the productive running of these institutions. So, for example, within schools, ensuring that there is a good education in terms of biblical matters so that children, once they leave, are fully aware of everything that is involved for the religion. Now, members of churches continue to carry out normal social roles, so they're not separated from society at all. And the demands of individuals to demonstrate their faith are not usually great in terms of restriction of their behaviour. Usually, obviously, for us, it's 10 church every Sunday. Now, churches are formal organisations with a hierarchy of paid officials and may be quite rich. In particular, they are often 
they often own extensive holdings of lands. So often what you'll find is those churches that are in the middle of your community, often the church owns that land. So they are quite rich in this sense. They've got a good hierarchy that then maintains and monitors the institution. And obviously if anything were to emerge in terms of abuse or anything like that, they can deal with it and modify the institution to ensure that that is dealt with accordingly. It is not a organisation without any clear guidelines or boundaries. Now, churches traditionally try to protect and preserve a monopoly of religious truth because they believe that they are the only genuine religion within society that is giving the people the opportunity to observe and acknowledge the true meaning of the big questions in life. So births, births, deaths and marriages. Really, why does that all happen? Now, this is a really interesting point for us to acknowledge with churches because they are then saying that what they are, what they promote and what they are believe is the only genuine truth when compared to all the other religions. Now, Robertson argues that there has been an increase in church-state tensions throughout the world. There now seems to be little room for religious concerns in the world, so governments may come into conflict with the moral concerns of domestic churches, meaning that the church may start to lose some of its footing it once had in the society because it cannot wholly control that state anymore. Now, as I said in previous videos, he's going to make an appearance quite frequently. Now, Steve Bruce believes that the definition for churches was appropriate for pre-modern Christian societies. However, he points out that in 1550, uh, 1517, uh, Martin Luther began to question the teachings of the medieval church. And since then, there have been competing Christian institutions, which has led to religious pluralism. So various religions being obviously operating within society and peacefully with one another. So he's arguing that this is not often the case. And as a result, there are a number of organisations today which are generally seen as churches, but do not conform to Trotsky's definitions. So it can question, it can be questioned about social change, membership, etc. Another evaluation point is many of the churches do, ha do not have a majority of the population as active members. So for example, in 2005, only 870,000 people were active members of the Church of England or other Anglican churches. Meaning, obviously, even though they are one of the most dominant churches within the UK, they do not have a large amount of active members within their wings. Another evaluation point here is churches are not always connected to the state and can be opposed to it, such as the supporters of Roman Catholic liberation theology in parts of Latin America. Now, churches are not always ideologically conservative. Um, Gracie da Grace Davy here um, claims that there are growing numbers of radical bishops in the Church of England, obviously maintaining and trying to get um, back to traditional values in the sense. And promoting the idea of members to do whatever they can to ensure this. And the last evaluation point here, most churches do not claim a monopoly of religious truth, but tolerate the existence of other religions. So the ecumenical movement encourages cooperative cooperation amongst different Christian churches rather than conflicting between each other. So obviously you can be right, but tolerate other, other religious beliefs within society. Now, we've covered churches, we're going to move on to denominations, which are slightly different to this. Now, Trotsky based his definition of a church on Europe, whilst in the United States there has been never been an established church, so one single church that has been linked to the state, etc. Now, Nabier in 1929, an American sociologist, argues that a different type of religious organisation, the denomination, is needed to be distinguished between that and the church. Now, in many respects, nominations are very similar to a church. They are formal organisations with a hierarchy of officials, and it is not difficult to become a member. Um, they draw members in from all parts of society, but compared to churches, have more supporters from working class and lower middle class backgrounds. Um, this partly could be because it's voluntary membership, so they can pick and choose the different type of denominations which are best suited for their belief systems at that moment of time. Now, denominations tend to be conservative, generally accepting the norms of values of society, through they, though they may have a slightly different values from others. So they may have a different take on how people should be acting compared to the rest of the wider society.
An example of this can be seen with Methodism. So Methodists are discouraged from drinking and gambling, although there are no absolute restrictions and those who take part in these activities are likely to be subject to no more than mild disapproval. So they will not be excommunicated or anything like that from the society. One of the main differences between a denomination and, ch and the church is that the de denominations are not connected to the state. Although they're not, they are not universal denominations, they reflect the religion of a significant minority. Um, so, for example, um, 287,600 people attended Methodist churches in England. Obviously, if we looked at the active membership of um, Church of England there, they have got a large chunk of very active members within these denominations in the Methodists here. So we've got to consider that they are a significant minority and they can possibly enact quite a lot of change as a result. Now, last point here for denominations, they do not claim a monopoly of religious truth as they have to coexist with other religious organisations because they know that they are not the most dominant within society. The next typology which we're going to be looking at is the sect. Um, according to Trotsky, sects are essentially the polar opposite to churches. They are smaller organisations and the larger ones tend to have thousands of members rather than millions, while some have only a handful of members. So as we can see that they can be really, really small or have a bit of a following, but they will never have as many members as a denomination or a church. So they are really small in comparison. Now one of the main things here that differs the sect from a church um, is that they are not connected to the state and tend to have, have norms and values that are quite different from the wider society. Um, so they can be regarded with suspicion and hostility by non-members and um, because often what they are categorised as as deviant in nature and um, because they are very subversive compared to the mainstream ideology in which a church may pump out. They may even be in opposition to the state and clash with law. They tend to be radical rather than conservative in any stretch of the imagination. Now as a bit of a sideline here, um, sex members often withdraw from wider world and dedicate their lives to the sect. They sit there and follow and only want to observe what they can see. So for example, sect members may live in a commune where they may have a house or an institution or a compound by which they can all live with each other under the guidelines and following the strict rules and regulations in which the sect promotes. Now members are also expected to show deep commitment to the organisation and usually have to adhere to strict morality imposed on them. So they will have very clear guidelines in which they have to follow. They will obviously have to, as a deep sign of commitment, possibly com contribute quite a lot significantly in terms of money, etc. Now, sects tend to only recruit adults who are willing and able to demonstrate their commitment to the sect. So it's not like a church where it's got universal membership. Children are not usually admitted until they are old enough to demonstrate this commitment and demonstrate they have a clear understanding of what this sect actually means. Now, the sect exercises um, as much control, um, a much stronger control over the members than churches and denominations in the sense that they want to ensure that these members remain committed and remain loyal to what the sect is promoting. So unlike denominations, sects do not tolerate alternative religious views but claim a monopoly on the religious truth. So they believe that they have wholeheartedly got the real understanding to those big questions that pester our lives. Usually sex are not organised through a bureaucratic structure and hierarchy but are led by a single charismatic leader whose personality helps to keep the sect together. So you've got that one person who's got a fantastic leadership quality, charisma, which draws people in and gets them to follow him and remain loyal to him. Now, the example is David Koresh and the Branch of Davidians here. And obviously, this is a very interesting part of it all because this was a sect which is quite subversive, subversive in nature. And he drew people in and got people to believe that he was um, Jesus Christ because that was one of the main, uh, main beliefs within his, his religion. 
Now, this all got people to acknowledge a different point of the world. And he would not accept another religion. And members would only be able to join if they would adhere to these strict guidelines. Now, I really recommend you look up this even further because it's a very interesting sect in itself. Now, the church sect distinction really needs to happen here. So these are two extremely different institutions. So Weber argued that churches are formal institutional organisations which have taken their characteristics of religious beliefs to a more intellectual and rationalised level. Now, the traditions and hierarchy work to restrain various emotional reactions to religious beliefs. While sects are overtly and deliberately emotional in nature and encouraging the mystical and at times even euphoric experience of individual members. So getting them pumped up with excitement so they can potentially have these euphoric um, experiences where they believe that God has come down and spoken to them. Within the sect, the religious experience is more of an emotional state than an intellectual discovery. So not by Bible study and reading and appreciating the text. It's all about the experience that they have had when worshipping. Now, this distinction between sects and churches is derived from Weber's distinction between char char charismatic and rational organised systems. Now, in a rationalised system, people follow predetermined rules and have specific expectations about how others will act and how the system itself will act. Now, authority is derived from the system it itself and those who are qualified a position of power and obedience is given to them on the belief that they should be followed because they have the position of power and they may have the educational background to obviously back up that position as well. Whilst in a charismatic system, um, people follow an individual person because they believe that this person has a special status and authority which transcends normal experience and expe expectations. Now, obedience is given because a person is emotionally caught up in a moment rather than intellectually persuaded to do so. So it's all, again, preying on those emotions, getting them to come over and join the sect based off of that rather than a rationalised, think thought through explanation. Now, the distinction carries on here with Wallace that highlights two characteristics, how they see themselves. Church and sects claim that their interpretation of faith is the only correct or legitimate one. Denominations and cults accept there may be many valid interpretations. How they see the wider society, churches and denominations, um, are seen as respectable and legitimate, whereas sects and cults are generally seen as deviant. Now, the evaluation of the, typo the traditional religious typology here. Steve Bruce, again, he's come up again, argues that both churches and sects have drifted towards char characteristics of a denomination. Churches can no longer claim monopoly on religious truth and are no longer universal. They are therefore increasingly like a denomination as a result. And this can really be reflected with such groups as Jehovah's Witnesses and Pentecostals, who once were regarded as a sect, are now drifting more towards the denom denomination point of view because they're having the same structures, etc. being put into place. And Alan Aldridge in 2000 argues that groups such as the Church Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, have a very ambiguous position in terms of what society is looking at there. So, for example, in the USA, they are regarded as denomination. Whilst in the UK, they are seen as deviant and therefore regarded as a sect. So we've got to be very careful when we're looking at typology because it can vary from society to society, meaning that it might be highly problematic just to apply a one-fits-all definition or typology to, to every single institution. Now, that's it for today's video. Um, if you've got any questions, let me know.